Picture a factory floor in Siberia where engineers are trying to do the impossible. They are building a plane twice, once with the help of the world and now completely alone. The MC-21 was poised to steal orders from Boeing and Airbus until geopolitics severed its lifeline. Now costs have skyrocketed by 65% and the weight of the aircraft has ballooned. Why push forward with a jet that is now heavier, more expensive and less efficient than the competition? Is there a secret strategy behind the madness? Here is what is really happening. To understand the tragedy, you have to understand the promise. When the MC-21 was unveiled in 2016, it was not just another plane, it was a dream machine. The specifications were enough to make Western executives nervous. The engineers promised composite wings, a feature that reduced weight and drag, delivering 15 to 20% better fuel burn than previous generation rivals. They designed a cabin that was wider than the competition, offering passengers unprecedented comfort in economy class. And then there was the price. The list price was projected to be around $20 to $30 million cheaper than Western equivalents like the A320neo or the 737 Max on paper. It was a mathematical slam dunk. Initial orders exceeded 280 units. The ambition was staggering. Ramp up production to 70 aircraft annually, targeting a total fleet of over 1,000 by 2035. It looked like Russia was finally ready to reclaim its title as an aerospace superpower. But buried beneath the glossy brochures and the ambitious targets was a secret that would eventually bring the entire program to its knees. The MC-21 was marketed as a triumph of Russian engineering. But if you peeled back the aluminum skin, you found a global puzzle. This Russian jet was actually a cosmopolitan creation. The avionics came from Honeywell and Thales. The landing gear was supplied by Safran. The hydraulic system Systems, the advanced composites and even the engines from Pratt and Whitney were all imported. Pre-2022, around 50% of the aircraft was comprised of foreign content. At the time, this international cooperation was its greatest strength. It meant the MC-21 had the best technology the world had to offer. It was a hybrid of Russian aerodynamics and Western reliability. But in the volatile world of geopolitics, your greatest strength can become your fatal weakness. The dependency on foreign suppliers was a ticking time bomb, and in early 2022, the clock ran out. The invasion of Ukraine changed everything instantly. Sanctions slammed down like an iron curtain, severing the supply lines that kept the MC-21 alive. Honeywell, Thales, Safran, they all vanished. Certification cooperation with the ESA and the FAA halted immediately. The prototypes that relied on these imported parts were suddenly grounded mid-build. The program was dead in the water. Moscow was faced with a choice, abandon the project or double down. They chose to double down. The order came down for 98% domestic component substitution. This was not just a repair job, it was a total reinvention. They had to replace about 80 complex systems with home-built versions. Think about the scale of that challenge. They had to replace the avionics suites, the flight controls, the hydraulics and the engines. Effectively, the MC-21 had to be redesigned from the ground up the United Aircraft Corporation or UAC set a target for full localization by the middle of the decade. But declaring a goal and achieving it are two very different things. Imagine trying to rebuild an airplane while it is essentially mid-flight. That is what the Russian engineers were tasked with. Every single substitution meant starting over, new testing, new certification, new supply chains. It was an engineering nightmare. The hydraulics had to be validated again. The avionics had to be coded and tested from scratch. It took three long years of grueling work, but slowly, the Russified jet began to take shape. Ground vibration tests were completed in August 2025. Over 80 flight hours were logged across hybrid and substituted prototypes. Then came the milestones. On April 29, 2025, the first MC-21310, fitted with Russian-made systems, finally flew from Irkutsk. It was a moment of immense national pride. This was followed by a second prototype's maiden flight on October 28, 2025. And then the big one. On 
November 14, 2025, that second prototype made the six-hour transfer flight to Zhukovsky for certification tests. It covered about 4,300 kilometers without stopping. It proved that the plane could fly using only Russian parts. But while the plane was flying, the factory floor was telling a different story. A plane is only as good as its engines, and this is where the MC-21 faces its biggest bottleneck. With Pratt & Whitney out of the picture, Russia turned to its crown jewel, the PD-14 engine. On paper, it is a marvel. It is efficient and claims to be on par with the Western CFML EAP engines. Certification testing has been ongoing throughout 2025, but building a prototype engine is one thing, mass producing them is another. Early production challenges have plagued the program, integration hurdles have slowed everything down, the first serial deliveries arrived in early 2025, but the ramp-up has been agonizingly slow. The industry is strained. The goal is to reach 25 units annually by 2027. This delay ripples through the entire supply chain. You cannot deliver a plane without engines, and right now, the engines are just not there in the numbers needed to support a commercial fleet. But there is another invisible hand squeezing the MC-21 program, the military. The civil suppliers tasked with building parts for the MC-21 are the same ones feeding military programs like the Su-57 fighter. The industrial base is being stretched thin. Parts, labor, and raw materials are finite resources. In a time of conflict, priority is given to defense contracts. The high-priority military needs are cannibalizing the resources meant for the civilian ramp-up analysts. Largely doubt that the Russian aerospace industry can meet both defense and civilian quotas simultaneously. This internal tug-of-war creates further delays. Every technician working on a fighter jet is one less technician working on a commercial airliner. The resources are simply not there to support both ambitions at full speed. And even if they could build it, the plane they are building today is not the same one they promised 10 years ago. Here is the harsh reality of isolation. When you lose access to the best global materials, you have to compromise. And in aviation, compromise usually means weight. The domestic replacements for the lightweight Western Com composites and systems have added significant mass to the aircraft. Recent tests revealed a 3.1-ton increase in the aircraft's weight. In the world of aerodynamics, 3 tons is a disaster. It pushes the maximum takeoff weight higher, it forces the engines to work harder, and the consequences are brutal. The range of the aircraft has fallen by about a quarter. The original PD-14-powered MC-21 target was around 5,100 kilometers. The new reality, confirmed in UAC's November 2025 technical update, is just 3,830 kilometers. That is a massive downgrade. The fuel burn has risen accordingly. The heavier structure and less optimized domestic materials mean the overall economics have slipped below Western standards. The MC-21's design brilliance could not outrun the physics of heavier materials. It is no longer the efficient Airbus Terminator it was promised to be. It is heavier, hungrier, and flies shorter distances. The promise of a cheaper aircraft has also evaporated. By 2025, the costs of the MC-21 had risen by more than 65%. The price tag now sits around 7.6 billion rubles per aircraft that is roughly 80 to 90 million dollars. The low-cost advantage is gone. The endless redesigns and import hurdles have eroded the financial logic of the plane. And what about the production lines? Serial production was greenlit in spring 2025. Irkutsk's manufacturing capabilities are being upgraded, but as of mid-November 2025, the delivery numbers are stark. Zero. No new MC-21s have been delivered to customers. The only activity has been the assembly of about seven Superjet new variants, pieced together from pre-sanctioned components to bridge the gap. Serial output for the MC-21 is now firmly rescheduled for 2026. The factory is open, the lights are on, but the planes are not leaving the hangar. Let's assume they fix the production issues, let's assume they build the engines. Where can this plane actually go? This brings us to the invisible wall surrounding 
surrounding the project certification without approval from the EASA or the FAA, which is impossible under current sanctions, the MC-21 is legally grounded in most of the world. It can only fly in Russia and a few politically aligned markets like Belarus or Iran. Russia is aiming for national certification by the end of 2026. They have planned 220 to 230 test flights across the prototypes to confirm compliance. The the second prototype's arrival at Tchaikovsky is a key part of this effort, but without international access, the market for this jet is tiny. It is limited to a niche operator base. It cannot fly to London, New York, or Paris. It is a bird in a cage. So, who is left to buy this heavier, more expensive, restricted aircraft? The answer is simple, the state. Aeroflot holds firm orders for up to 20 aircraft initially. Negotiations are advancing for 90 more. The total orders are expected to reach over 100 by 2030. This is a significant drop from the pre-sanction pledges. The customer base has shrunk to state-owned carriers like Aeroflot and S7. Global airlines are completely out of reach. No major international carrier would risk buying an uncertified jet with no support network. The market has collapsed inward. The MC-21 is no longer competing for global dominance. It is fighting for domestic survival. There is one final hurdle that is often overlooked. The ecosystem. You cannot not just sell a plane, you have to support it. You need simulators for pilots. You need depots full of spare parts. You need certified maintenance, repair, and operation centers, or MROs. Right now, that global network does not exist for the MC-21. Russia is scrambling to build domestic facilities, but scaling them lags behind the production of the aircraft itself. There are efforts underway. In October 2025, Ural Airlines initiated the construction of a 10 billion ruble maintenance hangar complex dedicated to the MC-21. This $100 million investment is aimed at creating base-level MRO capabilities to reduce reliance on foreign entities. But for any international carrier, adopting the MC-21 would mean rebuilding decades of Boeing and Airbus support structures from scratch. It is a logistical nightmare and a financial non-starter. Given the weight gain, the range loss, the cost overruns and the lack of a market, why does Russia keep pushing? Because the MC-21 is no longer just a jet. It is a symbol. It is political symbolism wrapped in aluminum and carbon fiber. Each new flight, like the recent non-stop journey from Irkutsk to Joukovsky in November 2025, is a message. It proves that Russia can still innovate under isolation. It proves that they do not need the West. The cost is enormous. Billions in state funding are being poured into the project. Over 14 billion rubles were allocated between 2025 and 2027 just for PD-14 engine upgrades. The program is being kept alive as a monument to self-reliance. UAC is still targeting around 36 annual units by the end of the decade. They are refusing to let the dream die, regardless of the economic reality. Yet even as the MC-21 claw toward its domestic dawn, whispers from the tarmac hint at a shadow program lurking in the frostbitten hangars of Kazan and Ulyanovsk. Enter the IL-114-300, Russia's forgotten workhorse. This is a turboprop twin dusted off from Soviet blueprints to ferry passengers across the endless Tiger. Sanctions did not just hobble the MC-21, they resurrected this relic, now reborn with new Klimov TV-7 turboprop engines and composite tweaks that shave roughly 20% off fuel thirst. It is no jet setter. It cruises at a leisurely 500 km per hour, around 270 knots. But but for short hops in Siberia's unforgiving sprawl, it is the unsung savior orders are trickling in. Dozens slated for state fleets by the late 2020s, it is a humble hedge against the MC-21's grand gamble. But here is the cruel calculus of isolation. Every ruble sunk into these birds is a bet against the black swan of détente. What if the winds shift? A fragile thaw in Geneva, a quiet nod from Brussels. Could the West's composites creep back? Could they slim the MC-21's Earth and stretch its wings anew. Dreamers in Akutsk sketch variants. The MC-21-400, a stretched behemoth for 220 souls, or a freighter skin to haul Siberian cargo across the Pacific. UAC teases certification by 2028, but skeptics scoff. 
the PD-14's teething pains, blade fatigue in sub-zero trials, supply snarls for titanium forgings, mirror the broader malaise rushes metallurgy wizards at VSMPO are maxed out, churning alloys for missiles and menageries alike. Zoom out, and the MC-21 is not just Moscow's albatross, it is a mirror to the global game. Boeing's 737 woes, door plugs popping mid-air, whistleblowers gagged, remind us that no empire flies solo. Airbus 2 courts peril with its A320XLR, chasing range on borrowed Chinese wings. The MC-21's saga screams a truth, aviation's golden age was forged in alliances, not edicts. Savor the threads and even geniuses grind gears in the dark. For now, as snow dusts the runways at Zhukovsky, the prototypes hum like defiant heartbeats. They will carve Russia's skies, stitching Vladivostok to Kaliningrad with homegrown resolve. Will the Airbus Terminator evolve into a regional rogue or fade to a footnote in sanctions law? The engineers, sleeves rolled in the Siberian chill, press on, because in the end, a grounded dream is still a dream, and Russia builds monuments from ruins. Check out another video here.